right, ladies and gentlemen, in this session at Group by Doug Lane will be talking about the Junior Developers Handbook. Take it away, uh, Doug. Yeah, I, I'm a filthy liar for this. The, the abstract was called the Junior Developers Kickstart, and I, it's too lazy to update the title, but take your pick. I like it. All right, so welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Doug Lane, and for eight years, I was terrible at my job, and that is the pretext of this whole session. So before we get moving, I do want to ask you all one question. If you're on the Slack channel, I want you to answer this question for me. As a junior SQL Server developer, I'm struggling with, and then fill in the blank. So if you would, take a minute and just throw me out your answer. What is it that's holding you back today? And Brent immediately says the senior developers. Okay, fair enough. You're making me think really hard because I'm like, what is holding me back? <laughs> it's probably me. <laughs> yeah, now this is aimed at junior developers, but if you've been around a while or if you're a DBA and you don't do much development, by all means, let me know what's holding you back. Okay, I see struggling with fighting fires, root problems. Oops. There we go. I like the not enough, uh, not knowing what to monitor. That's yeah. a good one. Okay, cool. So we're getting some good answers. And hopefully some of them will be answered by the session. It looks like, yeah, a few of them will. All right, cool. So. This is a graph of basically the value that I provided in the places where I worked. So I started my career in IT in 2000. I took MCSE night school and got my first job as a network and database administrator. Now the fact that those two roles are combined tells you how serious it was. It was at a dot-com startup and uh, I was not very good at what I did. And at the end of 2001, I got a call from a recruiter saying, hey, we noticed that you work with this special like vendor app. Do you want to come do a contract? I was like, sure. And when I told my boss, he said, oh, thank God, because I was going to have to lay you off. So I've never done a job, but that was kind of hard to take. So I did this contract work for a while, and then I ended up moving out to the Denver area and got a job out there. This is 2003. And I spent a good five years working at this company as sort of a middling web developer, but I kept my eye on SQL Server the whole time. Now you'll notice this line is pretty flat. At the end of 2008, I could sense that things weren't going well and maybe I wasn't doing the best job I could. And I started to work a little harder. And so there's a little uptick in that graph where I started to try to learn SQL Server a little bit more aggressively. Unfortunately, that was too late. Because January of 2009, my boss called me in and said, we're going to let you go. This was really hard news for me to take because unlike the first time where I almost got laid off, I was now a homeowner and I had a two-year-old son. And I had found out weeks before that my wife was pregnant. So I felt the weight of the world on my shoulders at that point. And I did what any rational person would do, I took a vacation. This is actually an already planned trip. I took my son down to see my parents and we went to South Padre Island. I tried to figure out what I was doing wrong. It was at that point that I had one of two revelations. I realized that I really had to start doing great work. This flat line was not going to get me anywhere in life and I was always going to be a target for being cut loose. So I decided to work harder. I decided to more aggressively learn. I decided to um, start attending group meetings, SQL Server user group meetings and the like. And what happened was what I was able to deliver for the people that I work for took off. I was better able to communicate the ideas that I had and the ideas that I had weren't terrible. I actually knew what I was talking about. 
And so it was it was a big deal for me to kind of come off that low trajectory here. The other revelation that I had a couple of years later was I had to start telling people about the work that I do. Now this took many forms. I did it through like presenting at user groups and SQL Saturdays. I started blogging a little bit more. Um, I've never really had great blog traction, but I did do some blogging, so I had a public profile that way as well. And I even made some videos along the way too. But the difference is dramatic when you look at that slope. It's huge. Now this second line is basically my con. Now I'm going to be transparent with you in this session, but I'm not going to be too transparent. So I'm not going to say what that line represents in terms of actual money. But I will show you that basically my income was very steadily but slowly rising over that time as well. Because you know, if I'm not doing great work, no one's going to really want to reward me for it, right? So here are the two lines again. This is where I started doing better work, and I started to tell people about it. And that's what happened to my compensation. It got better as well. Now, the line isn't all that dramatic. So here's the skill or the value that I delivered to my companies. The blue line is before, the red line is after. You can see there's a pretty dramatic gap there. I call that the value gap because that's the difference between what you are on a path to be doing for the people that you work for and what you could be doing for the people that you work for. And I want to emphasize here that there is nothing incredibly special about me. We all have our own unique gifts and talents and ways of looking at the world. So this is not a me story. This is an everyone story. This is not something that only a handful of people are capable of. It's a pretty simple formula that anyone can follow. And here is the trajectory of my compensation, what I was getting back for the value that I was providing. Now, there's not a big gap here compared, to, I'm sorry, there's it, or there it is. Um, there's not a big gap there, but there are things in that gap that can really matter to you. This could be moving out from an apartment into your first home. It could be, you know, a new car, a better engagement ring. It could mean donating more to charity. It could be any number of things that this frees you up for. Now, the value gap is bigger than the compensation gap, and this is the way we want it. We want you to be delivering more value to your company than they are compensating you for. Now, that sounds kind of dumb intuitively because you're like, well, doesn't that mean I'm underpaid? Well, maybe, but if you're happy with the compensation you're getting, does that matter? Probably not. And more importantly, when your company takes a turn down, they're going to look at the people that are overpaid, not the ones that are underpaid. And if you're delivering massive value to the people you work for and you're not overpaid, you're going to be there as long as you want to be in most cases. Now, there's no defense against layoffs that's 100%. Um, but this comes pretty close. So what we're here to do today is set you on a path that will grow your value gap, that will make you more of a standout in the workplace, both with what you know and how you communicate that, and make you too good to ignore. That's the goal here. And we're going to do that in two parts. Part one, we're going to talk about how to do great work. What we want to do here is rack up the quick wins because there's a lot of larger strategic stuff that I could talk about, but I want to make sure that you get plenty of things that you can walk away from the session today and start implementing and get that trajectory moving up in terms of your value. All right, so you got five parts to this. Part one, we're going to talk about set-based thinking. We're going to talk about how to manage dates easier. We're going to talk about writing new queries. I'm going to introduce you, if you haven't seen them already, to window functions. And then there are a few tricks that I have been doing in the last few years that I would have paid big money to know about in Management Studio in the 10 plus years that came before that. They're very simple, they're very effective, and 
There are times where your brain just wants to melt because you're doing something repetitive or something awful, and this will speed you right through. Okay, so let's talk first about set-based thinking. If you've come from a web development background or app development background, a lot of times when you interface with a database, you might do something that involves like an ADODB record set or, you know, doing while loops and stuff like that to retrieve one row at a time from SQL Server. SQL Server is not going to be happy with you about this because unlike an application, which is fine with doing things in loops, SQL Server is much happier to just go grab the entire chunk of whatever it is you need and bring it back all at once. An analogy to this would be if you took a bunch of keys to the bank and you wanted to deposit them. If you did that and came up to the teller and said, all right, I'm going to fill out this slip. Hang on. You fill it out, pass it over, and it's for one cent. The teller is going to look at you like, are you kidding me? I just, just give me the whole wad, right? Don't. Don't do that. So if you're trying to do things in a loop with SQL Server, you're making that bank teller angry because they're having to do a transaction for every single penny that you're handing across, as opposed to saying, all right, just give me the 100 bucks. Let's, let's just be done with this. And one of the things that when you aren't using a set-based mentality with SQL Server that happens to you if you're a developer is you will look at cursors and get excited because that's a much closer parallel to the way that you've been doing things if you were, say, a web or app developer. And so one of the things I want to show you now is a way that rather than doing things with a cursor, you can do things in a set-based chunk. So let me switch over here. There we go. Everybody see that all right? We can see it now. Okay, cool. So I've got a script here, and I'm going to use this sample database. And what I've got is something that I would have written back in 2005, 2007, where if I just want to go through and do one of two things, either update or insert, depending on whether or not a record exists, I'll do it in this while loop. So. I've got my declarations here. Uh, I'm going to declare a cursor and then do a select from sales invoices. And I want to get the customer ID and total dry items because wild word importers is different than adventure works. I don't know that it's much better, but it's different at least. Um, so what I'm going to do is open that cursor and then I'm going to fetch next into those variables. So I'm going and getting these one at a time. While the fetch status is zero, meaning while there's still something to fetch, I'm going to check and see if in this new table that I've got, there's an existing customer ID because I want to bring these into somewhere that I want to kind of match the two tables against. If that exists, I'm going to update it. So I'm just going to take the table that I want to target and update it with the variable that I populated as part of the cursor. If it doesn't exist, I want to insert it because if it's not already there, I want to make sure it gets there. And then I'm going to go through this one at a time. Now, this can be a very time-consuming process. The larger it gets, the worse it gets. And just as a caveat, there are times and places where cursors are appropriate. But if you're thinking cursors and you're a junior developer, odds are you're not going to want to use a cursor. There's probably a better way of doing it. So what we can do to clean this up is basically reduce it down to what it is we're trying to accomplish here. So if we want to get rid of some of this language, we'll get rid of all the cursor stuff. And look at the, the logical way that we're trying to construct this. Basically what we want to say is if it exists, we want to update it. If it doesn't exist, we want to insert it. It's really as simple as that. So once we cut out all the cursor language, and I'm going to spare you the typing, we can end up with something more like this, where we, we basically just join the two tables and we say, all right, I want to look for matches based on the customer IDs. So I'm going to join sales invoices to the new invoices. 
And since the new invoice is, is the table we want to update, we'll put that one what's referenced in the from. Once that runs, we will have updated everything that's in there. And then we can move on to the insert part. Now the insert is the same thing. Oh, and I lost my join down there. On. There we go. Okay. So on this bottom one, we'll just insert sales new invoices and then we'll use the select and we'll join it to itself. So it's kind of trickery because I'm referencing that table twice, but I'm saying, all right, look at what is mismatched or I'm sorry, unmatched between invoices and new invoices and anything that's not there, I want to pull in to new invoices. This will go a lot faster. Again, the number of rows that you have, the larger that gets, the faster the difference will be between the two. So this is one way that you can go through and rather than having to loop through and check if something exists and then if it does, update. If it doesn't, insert it. You can just do two simple statements, the update and the insert. Okay, any questions on that one? This Tara is a 90 minute in. session, so we got plenty of time for questions. <laughs> Tara jumped in and said cursors are always the answer. Nah. <laughs> That's fantastic though. I can't tell you, like when I first started, I same thing. I think everyone makes that mistake. Cursors are everything. And then you learn, oh no, 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 SQL like sets. So that's awesome. Yeah. And it's an easy trap to fall into here. Uh, you know, if if you've come from a background for doing things, you know, in a single iteration at a time. Uh, so yeah, it's something I spent years doing wrong and I wish I had known about it. Um, figured it out eventually. All right, so moving on. Oh, a cursor that, that calls another proc that has a cursor. That's what Rich found. Oh! Cool. Yeah, sorry, I'll let you keep going. No, no, no. All right, so you didn't see this coming, but boom, here it comes. This session comes with a little bit of homework because if you're a junior developer and you do want to get better, you're going to have to take some steps for yourself. It's not enough to just sit here listening to what I'm telling you and try to absorb it and then just get on with your day. So here is your homework. If you have never dealt with removing cursors before, what I want you to do is find a loop in your code. A cursor it may even just be a while loop. Find a loop somewhere in the code. Replace it with a set-based operation if that's possible. And then test it and see how much better it is. And this is not something that you should do in production. It's something you should, you know, save off somewhere else where it's safe to mess around with things, obviously. But find a loop, replace it, see how it goes. Okay. Next thing we're going to talk about is how to work with dates easier. Now, I have written date part and all kinds of date stuff more times than I can count. But there's actually a better way of doing the cases, and that's with a date table. So a date table is a wonderful thing to have in your databases. It provides you with a single source of information for your organization. So if there's some disagreement about maybe how you abbreviate things, or if you need to keep track of when your fiscal year begins and ends, these are things that can all be stored in one place. So when you reference them, you don't have to say in your code, well, okay, let's see, if the month is July, August, or September, that's fiscal year quarter one. If it's October, November, December, it's fiscal year quarter two. That logic everywhere you go. You can simply have what's the date and then Another column in that date table can say, all right, this is second quarter, fiscal year, whatever. It saves you from having to do the date name, date part, and a lot of the other date math and operations that you would normally have to code if you didn't have this table. And it allows you to establish alternate realities. When I say an alternate reality, I'm talking about things like fiscal year, you know, things that exist only for your company. So if you wanted to say that 2017 to 2023 is the age of goats, go ahead. 
You know, you can put whatever you want in there. You can reference that table however you like, and everyone will be on the same page when it comes to what things are called. Now, this is probably the most common thing that I used to do when I didn't have a date table. I would do cast date name month, so I try to turn that into December. I would cast the uh, date as a two uh, two character bear care and you know get the date number and then get the year just to spit out that number at the bottom now this is an incredible right? the more you'll hate it and what you can do instead is just pull this out of a date table so let's take a look at how we can construct one I'm going to jump in while you're switching here. I learned date tables from you, and it absolutely oh, nice. saved me. We wanted to compare today, like the current date to last year's same date in a sales report. And yeah. because I did the date table and had the two dates in there, super easy. Sweet. All right. So I wrote a script to create my own date table, but there's one that exists, and you won't find it in the AdventureWorks regular sample. You'll find it in the data warehouse one, the AdventureWorks DW database. It has something called dim date and I like to use dim date as well because um, I did work with uh, analysis services for a while and, and dim is a multi-dimensional uh, construct where there are fact tables and dimension tables and the dim is just short for dimension meaning kind of a lookup table. So I like to call it dim date so I don't have a date table called date, which is a reserved keyword, which you really shouldn't be using. So mine's called dim date, just like AdventureWorks. And what I'm going to do is um, I've got the OLTP version of AdventureWorks on here. I don't have the data warehouse, so I'm going to build this table from scratch. I want it to start uh, in the year 1899, and I'll have it end in the year 2100. And I'm going to put some fun stuff in there. There's uh, day, name of week, day, number of month, day, number of year. Week number of year, and ISO week number of year. This is kind of a fun one. If you've ever dealt with this column, uh, the week versus ISO week, there's a difference because one of them starts on the first day of the year, and one of them spills over from the last week of the previous year. And you can actually end up with week 53. So if you're going to do anything that involves week, I suggest that you kind of look into the differences between week and ISO week. They're slightly different, and it may kind of muck up what you're trying to report on because you may have, like, January 2nd be the week that looks like it came from the previous year. So just one of those oddities to know about. Also got calendar month, quarter, year, semester, and then a bunch of fiscal stuff that I want to fill in, too. And... This is one where I actually have to do a loop in order to populate this stuff because the values are always changing. I'm going to fill in my fiscal calculations and do a bunch of other stuff. Okay. So we'll do the fun part. We'll run it. Ah! Month name. Oh, shame on me. I changed it. What did I call it? Insert dim date. All right, so week number of year. Month full. Ah, okay. See, I think this broke the last time that I gave this presentation, and I fixed it on the fly, and I didn't save it. Shame on me. All right. So let's do a little debugging here. All right, in case you're wondering, what I just did on my keyboard was Control-K followed by Control-U to uncomment, and then Control-K and Control-C to comment. So Management Studio has these things called strings, and you can do two, com or two keyboard commands in tandem to make something happen. And Control-K, Control-C will comment, Control-K, Control-U will uncomment. It's really handy. So it saves you from having to do a whole bunch of dash, dash, dash everywhere. All right, so let's try this again. And this should take in the neighborhood of 30 seconds. But what it's going to do is it's going to create all this stuff for me, and I'll have a whole bunch of columns that I wouldn't normally get. And, and they're all 
already knows about it. Here's another keyboard shortcut if you want to uh, keep track of these. Uh, Control Shift R will refresh IntelliSense. So if you ever get the red squigglies and it doesn't know about changes that you've made, you can hit Control Shift R and it will catch up and kind of refresh its cache so it knows about all the objects that are in your database. Oops. All right. So let's see what we got in here. We've got a date ID, a first, and if we scroll down, you can see the first day of the following month resets, all of these. Full calendar date, day of the week, day of, name of the week, day number of month, day number of year, week number of year, ISO week number of year. And this is where there's weirdness between the two because ISO thinks that this Sunday is part of the previous week and uh, the week number is different from that. So again, SQL Server gets a little goofy with these two. Month full name, month abbreviation, calendar month, there's all this stuff. And this is just different text representations of the same date. Where this really comes in handy is if you have to do reporting and then some argument about whether um, whether July is July or J-L-U or J-U-L and uh, whether calendar year should come before the number, things like that. If you have to put in labels on a bunch of charts, uh, the people that write reports will love you for having this table because they won't have to do any of the logic in the labeling. They'll just say, I want this column name, and it's going to display exactly what I want it to. So there's all kinds of goodies in here. And, you know, as you look across, think of all the date name and date part stuff that you won't have to write with this. Um, it really is fantastic. And it's it saved me hour upon hour of development work. I love this stuff. It is so cool. Are you going to post this script somewhere? People are asking that. Yeah, yeah, I can post that script. Perfect. Um, so uh, the one thing that I would caution you on is that it's kind of sample data in terms of like the fiscal year columns. So if your fiscal year starts in September, you don't want to <laughs> deploy that table as is. You're going to want to go through and and you know fix it up to set things right. All right, so it's your turn. What I want you to do is find out if your team has a date table. They may already have one, which would be pretty sweet. Um, shame on them for not telling you about it. <laughs> if they do have it, start using it. If they don't, um, I'll post a script for this one. You can also get the AdventureWorks Data Warehouse copy. I'll post a link to that as well. Um, my this is just in the, uh, the Microsoft blogs. They've moved over to GitHub, which is it's good and bad because you used to be able to just go grab the .ba, that whole uh, database. But they've split things up a little bit into like uh, SSDT projects and stuff like that. But there's a dim date CSV file that you can go get uh, in particular, and I'll post the link for that later on. And then try it out. Try looking through your code to where you might have a bunch of date name, date part stuff, and join it to the dim date table. One thing that's really cool about this too is that you're working with days and over the span of even a couple of centuries, you've only got, I think it's around 75,000 rows, you know, one for each day. So you're not going to join to a massive table when you're going to something that's going to be pretty quick and you can index it however way you like. Uh, but mostly you'll be joining on the date ID and, um, and the, the full date. All right, moving right along. New queries. One of the things that I always wondered about when I was kind of struggling is, and actually I, I still kind of wonder it today, so the question never fully goes away, but I, I wondered what do other people do in terms of new query templates? What is it that I should have when I sit down and I want to write a new script? Whether it's a new just basically SQL script or if it's a stored proc, what are other people doing that might save them time, make it easier to read, things like that? So what I want to show you is the template that, that I use now, and probably three years and change ago I adopted. But it contains basic information 
that helps me understand what the script does and like where it's safe to run and things like that. So I always start mine with a big comment block and um, a little bit of, of uh, behind the scenes disclosure. Uh, most of this block uh, was inspired by the scripts that we had when I worked for, uh, for Brent. So, you know, where to run it, if it has limitations, things like that. And you'll see a similar comment block in the open source stuff from the first responder kit. The script name and whether or not I can run it in sections or if I can just F5 the whole thing. Because I want to know if I pop this open, if there are different parts to this script, I may not want everything to run at the same time. I may not want to run one section at all unless it's an emergency, things like that. But I also don't want to have to comment things out. Now there are ways that you can kind of set this up to track people so that they don't run the whole thing at once. I'm not going to get into that, but it's you just basically throw an error right away if they try to run the whole thing. Um, but what I say here is I'm going to run it in sections or I'm going to run the whole thing. And then I'll explain what it does. Now this one is obviously just showing a template for new scripts and procedures. Um, but if it has outputs and things like that, you could mention that too. Like, you know, this is part of a sequence of scripts that you would want to run and so forth. Limitations, if there's anything that I need to know about this script, like for example, if it won't run in versions prior to 2012, if I'm doing a window function, say, those for the most part didn't exist before SQL Server 2012. Or if I'm referencing a temporal table, that didn't exist until 2016. So there's a bunch of stuff that I'm going to want to know about um, if my query is going to break and I try to run it in you know, different environments. Is it safe for, for production? I make sure that this is always a question that gets answered in the comment block that starts my script. Because if there's one thing that's going to, to cause a lot of damage, it's not knowing whether or not this should have been run in production. Now, hopefully, if you're not supposed to be running any scripts in production, you know, your company has you kind of walled off from that. But if you are able to run things against production, it's good to have this comment block in here to let you know that, you know, this is really dangerous and for fun and testing purposes only, don't ever run this against a prod server. So a little while back, I wrote a blog post. Uh, it's the three letters that will make your DBA love you. I'll just spoil that. It's used. The one thing that your DBA will always want to see at the beginning of the scripts that you may pass off to them is the use statement. And that's because a lot of times in a company you'll have similar business objects um, that will end up having similar names across different databases, across different tables, across different views, whatever. And it can get really easy to mix up where that script is supposed to run you could take a query that would logically run in one database, pull it over to a completely different database, and it will actually run there just because there's so much overlap between the different logical constructs that you have. So I always start out my scripts with use statements. The other thing that I like to build in is the six time and IO on. I don't have to run this with every iteration. In fact, I don't really want to, but I like to have it there. And it's tell me is as soon as I start trying to script out, I'm going to see how much time it takes in terms of both elapsed time and time. I'm also going to see how many reads this query is doing, which is important. If you saw Eric Darling's session immediately before, he was poking around in execution plans and he was also looking at the statistics. So what we're going to do is check out this query. And let's say that I'm writing this query from scratch. I'm just doing brand new development here. So what I'm going to do is I've already got this pre-written, but I'm going to take some stuff out here. And I'm going to make this pretty small. All right, so I'm going to set stats time IO on. All right, that's done. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run this query. And you'll notice that I've constructed this in a way that I have a table that I'm joined to here, the sales order detail. I like to put all of the columns that I'm referencing from any given table 
on line or a line or lines by themselves. Reason is if I want to comment out this table, I can do it much quicker if all the stuff that came from that table are grouped together. So I'm going to run this. Oh. Shame on me. That's why you put use first, people. All right. Get my results back. So down here I see that I got 609 rows. I got 689 logical reads. Now there's CPU time and there's elapsed time. It's easy to look at these and not know A, which one matters, and B, what the heck is going on if the CPU time exceeds the elapsed time. This can happen when your query goes parallel, meaning it uses more than one core in order to get the job done. It will actually take your workload, break it off into multiple parts, and then reassemble it. When that happens, each thread that it goes down will count its own CPU time, and then that CPU time will get added together as part of the entire plan. So I could have, in this case, um, it's less, but say that I had 150 milliseconds. It could be that it decided to use six cores at 25 milliseconds apiece. That would get added up, but the elapsed time may only be 50 milliseconds. What you want to focus on here is the CPU time and the reads. Elapsed time isn't really up to you. You can't, you can influence it, but you can't really control it. The reason is if you have a gigantic data set, the elapsed time includes the time that it takes to render all this stuff in Management Studio, to basically spit out a spreadsheet of your results. And that can take a while. So if you're trying to tune up a query, or if you're trying to understand why it's slow, don't really focus as much on the elapsed time. Worry more about the CPU time. OK, so I've written this query. And I've started with the one table, because I want to establish a baseline of how slow this thing is going to be right out of the gate. All right, so I'm returning uh, about 100 rows here, and it took me 16 milliseconds and 639 reads. Let's see what happens when we tack on this second table. All right, that was pretty quick, too. And if you didn't have stats, I.O., and time on, you wouldn't really notice a difference, right? Because if you look down here in the corner, it still says zero seconds. So it went from you know under a second to under a second, big whoop. If you look over here, we do see that there's more disk activity going on. Now we've done another 1,100 reads, which you know we're fine with that because it came back quick. And also the CPU time doubled. So whether you saw it or not, the CPU time actually doubled. And this can be a significant thing to keep track of because if you have a query that runs over and over and over and over and just like punches the server repeatedly, you know, hundreds of times a second, this does add up. And notice too that our lapse time went way up. It went up to 180 milliseconds. I'm willing to bet that has more to do with rendering all this than anything else. But just the same, we'll keep going. As I'm adding stuff to my query, I want to see if I'm going to fall point. Because right now, I, I've doubled my CPU time, but it's still, for, from my point of view, acceptable. I can deal with a you know, 30 millisecond query. So let's tack something on here. Let's do a cross join. And I'm doing this to be basically tunes as the driving cat and drive it off a cliff. And I'm going to do a cross join here. So now we've got 115,000 rows. And this is starting to get a little heavier. Now I'm at 110 milliseconds. And it took almost 13 seconds just to return all that stuff. So you can see how that elapsed time delta grows as I'm trying to accumulate this all and bring it back. I could keep going. I could make this worse and worse. But you get the idea. As you're going through and building a new query, you can have in mind what you want the end result to be. But as you're doing that, you do want to keep tabs on performance because if you just write run it and say it's slow, you're going to have to deconstruct it going the other way. And it's just easier to start with the one table. Make sure that you're getting the results you expect from that one table. 
and then build upon that and watch for when you go off a cliff. When you do finally go off a cliff, it's either something that you wrote or something that's missing on the database side, like say an index that would make this go a lot faster. And that's when you get into things like execution plans, which is kind of beyond what we're gonna talk about today. But just the same, that's kind of the next step for when you are writing a query and trying to make sure that it's going to perform well. Okay. It's always a lag when I tell it to switch. There we go. So now it's your turn. Just like the date table, I want you to find out if your team has a template for writing new queries. Because you don't want to make everyone mad by saying, hey, I've got this great new template, and everyone says, we've already been using this other one. You know, give it the program. So find out if there's one already out there. If there's not, one thing that you can do is try the new stored procedure uh, template in Template Explorer. If you just go to View, you'll see Object Explorer, Solutions Explorer, Template Explorer. And you can go to the Stored Procedures folder, and you'll see one there. Use the one that says menu in parentheses after the, uh, the new stored procedure, because that one has junk in it. But try that one out. And then if you have important parameters, like I strongly recommend that you add safe for production to your comment block at the beginning to specify whether or not you're going to blow something up if you run it in prod. And anything else that might be pertinent to your organization. I also okay. like to include in my comment. Oh yeah. Oh, sorry. I like no, to no, include in my comment block. Like if I'm if it's a store procedure or something like that, I like to include like a safe run for that store procedure. Like here's an example of how you could run it and it's a safe customer to run it against or something like that. So Ooh, that good. if there's a problem it can yeah. <laughs> nice. I hadn't heard that one before. That's clever. Okay. So gonna talk about window functions. This is like my favorite topic under the sun. I can't get enough of window functions. Once I discovered them, my life was forever changed permanently. So if you've ever tried to do row number in SQL Server, you've tried to use a window function. It's just that way back in 2005 when they introduced row number and rank, people didn't really think of those as window functions. They just thought of them as row number and rank because there really weren't any other counterparts to those. Now we've got a whole raft of things that you can do with window functions. In terms of what window functions do, look at it this way. It used to be that if you wanted any sort of awareness about the data set that you were returning, you had to do some sort of subquery. You had to come back with a result set and then do another query on top of that to examine the initial results. Now what you can do is do both in the same result set. Another way of looking at this is, imagine if you work in a giant office and there's nothing but cubes everywhere. If you are sitting in your cube and the walls are too high and you can't see over them, if someone asks you about what's in the cube in front or what's going on in the cube behind or the cube to the left, cube to the right, you don't know. It's the same awareness level that like a single single cell in your result set would have in SQL Server. But with window functions, you can actually kind of prairie dog and say, two rows ahead, that's what's going on, three rows back, that's what's going on, and then all together, this is what's going on in the aggregate. It's pretty sweet. It's a level of awareness that we, we had to really code around before 2012 came. So I'm gonna show you some window functions and the syntax, let me go back here. The syntax is really not as complicated as it may seem. There's a lot going on in terms of what you can do with window functions, but they all follow the same basic structure. So you're gonna need a red Lego and an orange one, a yellow one and a blue one. And what you fill in in between are things like column names and numbers. So some of the stuff that you can do with window functions includes row number, rank, lag, which looks behind, lead, which looks ahead in the result set, first value and last value, 
kind of self-explanatory. They'll give you the first and last value in the set. Sum and average. And normally when you do sum and average, you have to do some sort of group by. But you don't here. What you do instead is you specify the partition by. And we'll see examples of that here coming up. Um, so every window function has the function itself and then over, which you'll always have, and then partition by, perhaps, which tells you, all right, this is the scope of what we're talking about. This is how far uh, or which values we want to separate by. So, um, well, we'll look at it in the script. And then there's order by and rows between. And again, some of these are optional. You don't have to put them in every window function you do. Here's row number as a window function. So what we're going to do is order by due date. We're going to partition by due date and customer ID. So what that means, when I say partition by, is that the scope will reset every time I hit a new instance of whatever I'm partitioning by. So if I'm doing row numbers by due date and customer ID, so for today, for customer ID 3, I want all the orders, and I'm going to number them. As soon as it rolls over to tomorrow, or as soon as I roll over to a new customer ID in my result set, that row number starts over again. And then when I say rows between, you can specify, if you don't specify anything, it'll, it'll grab all the rows. But if you wanted to say, like, I want to look at all the rows behind me up till now, which is great for things like year to date, you can say, I want unbounded preceding and current row. So look at all the stuff that happened up till now and then stop. It's, it's amazingly powerful and uh, it's, it's incredibly easy to use. Let me pull that up and I'll show you a script of some window functions here. So here I've got AdventureWorks. I'm gonna not make the mistake I made last time. I'm gonna run that. What I wanna do is select customer ID, due date, total due. I've got row number, I've got the total due. As I'm partitioning this differently, you'll notice there's no group by here. I'm doing a sum, but with this first one, I'm not going to partition at all. So basically, it's the same thing as a sum with a group by nothing or a group by all the detail uh, columns. And I'm going to do a sum of all the stuff by due date. So for every due date, I want to rack up a sum. The next one is the customer total due for every day and customer ID combination. I want to find the sum. With lag and lead, what I can do is tell it, I want to look one row back. That's as far as I want to go. So I'm looking for the previous due. And this zero is a little bit different because I'm telling it, if there's not a value there, normally it would return null. And sometimes we want to see that. But if I don't, I'll just say, you know what? If if there isn't a previous row, just say zero. And then I'll do a lead and I'll look three rows ahead. So what's coming up? I'll say that's ahead three rows due. There's first value and last value. Now there's a little quirk I'm not gonna get into, but, um, but with last value, you have to use certain parameters in the rows between or you're gonna get a weird number. Um, but there's first value and last value, and I'm going to order by due date, because whenever you do something where you say first and last, it's going to need to be able to order this somehow. Same with lag and lead. It's got to have an order in order to tell you what came before what. And then what's really sweet is running totals. You can do running totals much easier now with Windows fun window functions than you used to be able to. So with this, I just want to do a sum of total due, and I want to do the order by due date, and then between the unbounded preceding, which means all the way back to the beginning, and where we are now, running total. And then you can do other fun stuff, like if you say, look at stock charts, or you look at any sort of, of business metric where you wanna say, well, how are we over the last 13 months, for example? Um, with this one, I'm doing the last four rows, and rather than saying unbounded preceding, I'm saying do just three rows back. So I want to get this and the three before. So I'm going to run all this. 
and it doesn't take very long, but I'm doing a whole lot of thinking, which is wonderful because it used to be that this was more work for SQL Server and a whole lot more work for you to write. So I've got my due date, total due, customer order, grand total, total for the day, total for the day and the customer, date average, customer date average, previous due, ahead due. And here's my running total. Um, last due, and so on. So there's a lot of stuff that you can do now, calculations-wise, that you couldn't do before. Where you really get to cooking with gas is when you put the window functions together with your dim date table. All right, so I'm going to run this. Hopefully I didn't break anything. Good, no. All right, so now I'm looking at calendar year and the total due quarter to date because I have quarters in my date table, year to date, all time, running total, remaining future total, which is kind of cool. You can do like current row to unbounded following, which is the opposite of proceeding. The percent of that total that remains from this point on And this is where nulls come into play with that lag function. If you tell it lag and you don't specify the default value of zero, this is what you're gonna get, a bunch of nulls. Sometimes you wanna see that because you wanna know exactly where things actually begin in terms of real data. But you can do all sorts of fun stuff by putting together dim date and window functions. Come on. All right, so now it is your turn. Before so, we go to the homework, can I ask you a question? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this came into the to the question section. Sure. Um, when using a dim date table and joining a table with a date time field, does this cause more problems since you have to convert the date time um, field to a date in order to join to the dim date table? No. No, that's one that SQL Server uh, will not do an implicit convert on and blow the whole thing up. It's fine. Okay. That's good with that. So your turn. A few years back, I actually made a couple of videos on windowing functions that were part of the T-SQL level up course with uh, Breno's R Unlimited. And uh, I, I'm still really happy with them. And now they're out on YouTube for free. So uh, if you just search Breno's R Windowing, they'll be the ter first two results that you get. Uh, if you want to know more about window functions, the window functions layout one and syntax is going to be a lot of what we just covered, but there's also a whole other video on how they perform. So if you want to see how well they do in terms of uh, performance and how many you can pile on before things get bad, that's a fun video to watch too. I have a poster at sqltheater.com that's the four parts of the window functions. Back here I had a kind of a slide that alluded to that, but there's more explanation of how these get pieced together. Um, and in full disclosure, uh, you get it when you sign up for my mailing list, so if you don't want to deal with that, I understand. But anyway, it's there if you want it. Okay, now we're going to talk about Management Studio Speed. These are some of the most tedious that I've had to deal with over the years that if only I had known there was a shortcut for, and it turns out there actually was. So I'm going to hop over and show you a script that we can mess around with. All right, so got another script. There's two things that I want to show you here that are a lot of fun. Number one is when you need to replace multiple lines, replace the same spot on every line. The other thing is when you get garbage script output, like a lot of times you'll um, you'll bring it in from uh, some other text editor or something like that, or paste it, you know, off the internet, and you'll get multiple lines in between each line, and it's infuriating because now you've got, you know, tons of white space that you want to get rid of, but there's no convenient, quick way to do it. I'm going to show you a couple of tricks how we can clean up a script like that. So I don't even really need to run this query, it's more just a matter of, of 
cleaning up the tech. What I do is this is going to drive me nuts, all these goes, because I have some cleanup to do, and I can't do that with all these goes in the way. So what I want to do is I'm going to find and replace, and I was struggling last night to make this little box bigger. I don't know why it's so tiny, but anyway, just try to squint with me. What I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this little star, and that means use regular expressions. Now, regular expressions, I have the same reaction that most people do. Uh, when I hear that, I just want to run for the hills because I, I want no part of regular expressions. They're so weird. They're so complicated that just, it, ah, it's cringeworthy. But what I'm going to do is turn this on, and I'm going to look for something very specific. I'm going to look for go, and you know the letters G-O might appear somewhere else in here. I don't want to mess with that. But what I do want to find are goes that are sitting on lines by themselves, because I don't want those anymore. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to type slash R, and already I'm getting stuff highlighted, slash N, and then I'm going to type go. And now all my goes are highlighted along with the line breaks. It's, it's similar to, to uh, if you've ever done this in uh, Visual Basic or VB.net, it's going to be, I'm really showing my age by saying Visual Basic there, uh, VB.net, it would be like VBCRLF. It would be carriage return line feed kind of a thing. So what I'm going to do is replace these all with nothing. And now I'm in a much better position to work with all this stuff without all those goes in the way. That also frees me up for the second thing that I want to show you, which is Alt-Shift, which just, it, it was mind-boggling when I, when I found out about this. Say we've got a problem with this query where we can't really do a find and replace. Maybe there are four values over here and three columns over here. I could go through and say, I'll just add currency code twice because I'm lazy. I could go through and add this a second time. I would have to do that for every line. And if you've ever had to type anything repeatedly in Management Studio, there's this part of your brain that starts to malfunction after you've done about 20 or 30 lines of that. You just start you know, kind of crazy laughing to yourself. Um, or maybe it's just me. But what I want to do here is take what I've just done with currency code and a comma and do it all the way down the line. What I'm going to do is hold down, and it's a bad example because I've already done that line. I'm going to hold down Alt-Shift, and I'm just going to start going down the line. And you'll notice that this cursor is on every line. Now when I start typing, I've just edited all these lines at the same time. I'm sure you're wondering, does the reverse work? Yes, it does. Same thing. It's magnificent. Um, another thing that you can do is say we've got all of these lines here, and there are varying lengths, because it's not always going to conveniently line up. I'm going to do the same thing. Come down to the bottom. I'm going to do Alt-Shift. And then I'm going to hold the Control key. What happens is the Control key, when I do text operations back and forth, it's going to, rather than do things one character at a time, it's going to do things in the way that it kind of breaks up words. Now, this doesn't always work. I probably should have seen that one coming. But uh, a lot of times, if you need to break th things up quickly, uh, like say you have file names that have no spaces in them or anything like that, that's a good time to make that work. I'm going to put that all back. My, yeah, my favorite is Control-Z because it undoes everything I've just done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, in this case, it's not going to work because you've got spaces in there. But if there were no spaces, um, it would all go kind of uniform back together. All right. So those tricks alone have saved me hours and hours since I found out about them. Um, I've had to use them a lot 
Uh, in fact, I used them recently once where I had to restore a whole ton of log files in order, and I had to go down the list, and they were in a different location. So I had to change the drive that they were on. Rather than do one at a time or do a search and replace, um, I was able to just go through and cut through them all. Um, one more thing that I can show you, and this is of limited value. I've yet to find a use case for it, but if you hold down the Alt key and you click and drag, you can do sort of a free form box. Now normally if you click and drag from here, you get line after line. So it's just sort of a fun thing. Someday I'll find a use for it and I'll be thrilled that I knew about it. But uh, until that day comes, I'm just gonna file that one away. Okay, can, can you repeat the keys that you use to do it um, word by word? Word by word. So what I did was I did an alt shift and then I did control and delete, which basically means I wanna suck, uh, let's see, backwards. I wanna suck things in word by word till they're gone. That's awesome. Everyone's talking about how their mind's been blown. <laughs> cool. All right. So write down that stuff and just keep it when, it, you know, someday you're going to use it and you're going to love the fact that you had it. And rather than look it up, write it on a sticky note, just put it somewhere on your desk where you'll be able to reference that. Okay. So we've been going for about an hour now. I had a bonus in here. I don't think I'm going to have time to get to it. But what I'll say is real quick, there's something called sargability that will blow up your queries. And I'll explain in 60 seconds how this works. If you've ever gone to church, funeral, or if you just go to church regularly, or wedding, whatever, there are hymnals, there are books that have numbered songs in them, right? And whenever people open their hymnals, they say, we're going to turn to page, you know, whatever, to read or to, to sing hymnal number 455. When you look through that hymnal, if it's referenced by the number, you're going to be able to find it pretty quick because you'll know, all right, I'm getting closer, I'm getting closer, I'm going, uh, no, there it is. And you can start singing. Um, now, inevitably, half the church will be late in doing this because it's always a slow process. But what happens when you tell your people to sing a hymnal that has the word glory in it? What? How am I supposed to find that? It's the same thing when SQL Server has to look for something where you say, for example, I want you to find all the things that have percent sign glory percent sign. Is SQL Server going to be able to do that quickly? No. It's going to have to go through and look at the title of every song in that book because there's no way for it to quickly reference, all right, do I need to move further ahead to find them all or do I need to move back to find them all? Could be anywhere. So there are things that you can do with your query. If there's any way that you can work around doing just an open string like that, by all means do it. If there's a way that you can avoid putting things like date name in your where clause or date part, date add, anything like that in your where clause where it can't immediately look at that and say, oh, I know what it's talking about and I know how to find that. There's so much more I could say about it, but I'm running out of time for that part of the whole presentation. So I'll just leave it at that. Sargability. It's something that you definitely want to look into because it's the way that you can tune your queries better without having to deal with doing any sort of like new indexes or anything like that. If you try to create new indexes to work around a non-sargable query, it's still going to be slow. So I wish I could say more about that, but we got to move on. Okay, part two. This is the point where there are switch tactics, and we're going to talk less about what you can do today and talk more about setting yourself up to be indispensable, to be too good to ignore, to have a huge value gap. One of the things that most people have trouble with, and I was definitely in this camp as well, is that it's hard to talk about what you do in a way that comes across as not bragging. So I've got a couple of quotes here. Hopefully they will help you out. I don't want, just want you to take it from me. So the first one, the fact is good work rarely speaks for itself. Managers are surrounded by hundreds of shiny objects seeking to grab their attention. Good work needs a little marketing. And this is from the Harvard Business Review. There's another quote. 
that I think you should hear. This is from a, a blog post on Medium. People rarely go out of their way to recognize the work of others. Everyone needs to promote themselves more. Women are especially bad at that because we think it's bragging. Screw that. Brag away. No one knows what you've done at your desk and how important it was unless you tell them. Not only is it good for your career, it's often useful information. Your coworkers will learn of your strengths and will know they can come to you for help. This is Donna Malieri, and she was writing about her experiences of being a female program manager at Microsoft. So I'm not just telling you this. There are a lot of other people in the world that have figured out that you can't stay silent about the work you do. Good work done in anonymity is never going to get you anywhere. So we're going to do two things today. We're going to start a success log. You can call it a progress log. You can call whatever you want. I like to call mine a success log because I just like to look at it and feel good about it. And then we're going to talk about how to spread the word. Talking about your own work isn't easy, so I'm going to give you a couple of tips that will hopefully make that a little bit easier. I like to keep things like charts and um, numbers because you want to be able to quantify the work that you do. And occasionally you just want to editorialize a little bit. So dear diary, today at 4.43 I kicked some ass. You want to be able to file away what you've done and how you've made a tangible, quantifiable impact to the business that you work for. If you have any sort of monitoring tool, this is a great place to go. A success log does a number of things for you. It helps you remember how you solve problems. Basically, if you don't have a work diary, you have to start digging back through email and assuming that you emailed anyone about the problem you solved, figure out, okay, what, what day did I do this? What did it look like? How is it better now? If you keep sort of a running log of this stuff, you don't have to go digging for it when it comes time um, to use it. It builds a case that you are making a difference. It's one thing your annual or, or however often you get a review and you sit down and you say, well, how was the last year? Oh, it was good. You know, I feel like I did some stuff. I, I think we're in a good place. What you want to do is actually build that case. No lawyer would show up to the courtroom saying, well, I feel like my client's innocent. And it's nothing like that. You actually have to provide evidence. And the same is true when you go through this process at work. And hey, a success log is better to look at than Twitter, right? What do you put in a success log? If you have email from happy people that you've helped, um, this just really has a nice feel-good effect because there are days you're going to show up to work and you're not going to feel like you make a difference. You're not going to feel like you matter. You're not going to feel like you know what you're doing. If you want to be able to, to kind of cheer yourself up, you can read through these and it will feel good. If you have stories, people love stories. Stories are wonderful. It's how we connect with each other. It's how we've connected with each other for centuries, millennia. It's how we pass on from generation to generation great things that have happened. And you want to do great things. Can't guarantee that your stories will last three, four thousand years, but you'll at least have them around for a little while. And then screenshots and spreadsheets. Don't steal that name. That's a role-playing game I'm working on. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. This is what mine looks like. I used to use Evernote. I use OneNote now because I find that copying and pasting stuff is a whole lot easier. Um, Evernote. I used it for a good six, seven years, and I, I've just kind of moved on. The other cool thing is if you have Office at work, you have, a, uh, you have OneNote. And if you don't have Office at work, but you have an Office 365 subscription, you have OneNote. And it'll sync all over the place. So um, what I do is I like to keep a log of what I did in a week. And some bosses I have found like to know what you're doing on a week-to-week -week basis. It's really easy to scrape that if you work for someone that wants that information and then just pass it on and say, this is what I did this week. And you can paste in screenshots, you can uh, even reference Excel spreadsheets. There's all kinds of fun stuff you can do with OneNote. Okay, so now it's your turn. What I want you to do 
is if you don't already know these, I want you to find at least three ways where your performance at work is measured. Not feel good stuff, but actually say, all right, if you need numbers to know how much better I am than I was six, what are those numbers? Or if I'm part of a project and I need to know what quantifies that project succeeding versus failing and how to measure my part in that, I need to know that too. In order to establish a baseline for these metrics, you need to know what they are. You establish a baseline, and then you start a success log with daily entries. And I can't emphasize this enough. It has to be daily, because if you skip a day, you will forget what you did the day before, and you will spend time digging for where the evidence of what you did the day before exists. It's so much easier to just develop this as a daily habit, write down what you're doing every day. Anything that hits one of those three metrics, you highlight it so that when it comes time to loop back and see, all right, what have I done over the last month, year, whatever, anything that hit those key points, the things that are most important to the people you work for, you'll be able to highlight those. Okay, and last, we need to tell people about what we're doing. It's great that you're keeping a diary now, but if you keep that diary to yourself, it's not going to help you a whole lot. You might feel good about it, but long run, it's not going to matter too much. So now you have to start telling people what you're doing. When you tell people about the work you do, you can do it internally or you can do it externally. You can do something like, you know, sharing at a morning stand-up meeting or, you know, a monthly meeting at work about how the team has progressed. And you can talk about the things that you've learned. When you do this and you share what you know, you are building credibility. And you can build that externally you work for, or, you, or I'm sorry, internally with the people you work for, or you can build that externally. Externally, for example, would be a user group, or you can do it just on a blog to whatever audience you might have for that. In either case, people are finding out that you know what you know. And this is what we want. We want people to know that you know what you're talking about. It will help you. And because this is group by and it's, you know, going to be something you can watch on YouTube, I'm going to lower my voice a little bit because you might be watching this at work. This will help you at this job or the next, one of the two. You want to build credibility at your job. But when it comes time to move on to a new job, you want to have the credibility externally to move on to the next job. You want people to know who you are and what you know, so they will find you and they will ask you if you want to work for them. And then the rest will take care of itself. Now it's your turn. What I want you to do is develop these two habits. I want you to share something you learned publicly. And when I say publicly, it's up to you what scope you're comfortable with. It can be a lunch and learn, it can be presenting a 5, 10, or even like a full half hour at a user group meeting. Heck, if you're not going to user group meetings, consider going to user group meetings because they're a great way to meet people. And you see that all kinds of people can get up and do this. You can too. I want you to share what you learn publicly. And I also want you to publicly thank someone who helped you. Again, do this internally, do it externally. Because we're all in this together. I didn't learn everything I learned on my own. Nobody else did it that way. We all have to depend on each other. And the more gratitude that you show to the other people that have helped you, the more gratitude you'll get back when you are sharing what you know. And it's a nice positive tornado that lifts us all up, throws us across a cornfield. And then I want you to commit to repeating steps one and two. I want this to be a habit for you because this is what will send that trajectory up. Not just what you know, but you need to share what you know. People need to know this about you. So what I want you to do is do great work and tell people about it. It's as simple as that. Build these habits up and then that value gap will, will grow and people will want you on their team. That's all I have for today. Thank you very much for attending. Oh, one footnote. 
of all this. Oh, and Brent shows up at just the right time. This is great. Hello. So I mentioned before, I mentioned before that what I told you about today will make you better at what you do. It'll make you more employable and also make you really valuable to the people you work for. That's not insulation against ever being laid off. Now, I've been laid off a couple of times. The difference is, when I was laid off the second time, I was in a place where I had a much bigger value gap. And I had put myself in a position to be known for what I was known for. The first time I was laid off, I was terrified. I can still taste the terror in my mouth when I think about how lost I was. The second time it happened to me, it sucked, but I didn't feel fear. I felt curiosity. I felt a, a sense of wonder about what would come next. I didn't worry about the fact that I was in a good place or not, because I knew I was. I put in the work, I would made myself better, and I told people about the work I was doing, and that made all the difference in the world. I can't promise you'll never be laid off, but I can promise you that you'll be in a good spot if you are. Nice, excellent presentation. And it's also not just about you know getting laid off either. What happens when you want to find a new place? You know, when you, I know I had horrible stories along on the way up where I had a manager uh, actually in a meeting once announce. He said, uh, "Everyone, you know, Brent's last day is going to be Monday." And I was like, w w "What?" He goes, "Yes." He goes, "You resigned." And I said, "No, I did not." And we had this unbelievable political thing happen after that. And I'm like, "Okay, I got it." I got to hit the eject button fast. Yeah. Wow. Was, oh, was, hey, surprise. one other thing. Um, before I forget, I, I wanted to say uh, a huge thank you to everyone that showed up. I did something kind of fun on Twitter last night. Twitter doesn't have to be a flaming hellscape like Southern California. <laughs> it can actually be fun. <laughs> so um, if you, you don't even have to follow the SQL Theater account if you don't want to. But I made a choose-your-own-adventure Twitter thread. So what I'll do is I'll I'll throw that up in Slack. Um, let me see where my notepad went. There it is. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! <laughs> yeah. It should only take you. Well, it depends on how many times you screw it up. <laughs> but there you go. Um, oh, SQL Server thinner. Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. Oh wow! Yeah, well, oh, this is... already happened, and I felt it was. You know, it would have felt like I missed the boat on that one, so I had to move it to Valentine's Day. That's pretty smart. So, so um, romance. it was funny, too, because I did this, like, late at night last night because I wanted to put it out there when none of the people that actually follow that account would see him. And I got a couple of retweets from, like, midstream. <laughs> <laughs> why would you? It was click no. here to recompile, and it was retweeted, and I was like, why would you do that? But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> People got to the exciting part Fantastic. of the thread, and they just decided they wanted to retweet it. Well, for those yeah, of you who are watching the recording, you'll be able to get to it through the recording page, too, if you go to groupby.org and search for Doug's site, or search for Doug's uh, session. We'll put the link to in there so you can follow it inside of there as well. Well, thank you very much, Doug, for presenting today. Nice job. Ta-da. Round of virtual applause for uh, Doug yeah. Barron's life.